a lot of stuff to go through this evening. So uh, again, to a few people have just literally joined. Um, welcome. Thanks for taking the time to uh, attend this webinar. Um, you've been invited via Talent Spa. Um, this evening is all about how to write a an effective CV, basically a LinkedIn profile. And uh, the presentations are one-way audio broadcast, so you'll be able to see or should be able to see some slides. You'll hear my dulcet tones, but I can't see you. I can't hear you. You can't see me. Um, however loud you might shout. And therefore, in terms of uh, uh, asking questions, uh, which most people tend to want to do at some stage, if during the session you've got anything you want to ask about the CV and LinkedIn profile or related subjects, just rattle it into the facility you've got in your GoToWebinar toolbar. And at the end of the session, I'll tell you when we've finished. And then I'll move into answering any questions. Those that need to disappear on time, you can leave at that time. Uh, those that want to listen to the answers of the questions, you're more than happy to, uh, more than welcome to stay on and listen to the answers, irrespective of whether you've asked a question or not. So uh, th there is a lot to go through this evening. So it's going to be fairly rapid pace, um, but hopefully um, some very interesting and relevant content. Uh, just a little bit about um, who we are uh, shortly. Um, I, I should say that. Uh, for those that are um, interested in um, taking another look at this presentation, um, you'll tomorrow morning at some stage get a link to a recording of the event. Okay, very briefly, who on earth are we? So just hopefully to give you a little bit of confidence in terms of what you're going to learn this evening about writing your CV and LinkedIn profile and how to get that sorted and work more effectively in the marketplace. Um, we as a company, the CV and Interview Advisors, uh, we're a partner with Talent Spa and a number of other professional associations and uh, membership groups. Um, we provide, unsurprisingly, CV writing services, interview coaching services, um, and similar to people uh, who are interested in using us. So that tend, tends to be individuals or corporations that want to improve their lot. Uh, just so you know, I, uh, not in an attempt to big myself up, but to give you, hopefully, again, a little bit more com comfort and confidence uh, that we know our stuff. My background is that I've been an employer of people and recruited folk. Um, I've been a recruiter within the permanent and contract markets, and I've reviewed literally thousands of CVs for this business and written a fair few as well. Um, the main point lurking behind that is that we see, I see, my colleagues see enough evidence to support the views that we have. We know what works in the marketplace. We know what doesn't work in the marketplace. Um, and that's valuable information to have. So hopefully as this evening wanders on, you'll get some good insight in terms of what does work and what doesn't. Um, my colleagues, very similar backgrounds. Interestingly, some of them have published, uh, are published authors in their own right. That's a skill, actually, that will become apparent later on in the session. And importantly, there are going to be a few cliches flying around this evening, I'm afraid. One of those is hot skills. We'll talk a little bit more about those later, but it's important you know as an individual or find out what the hot skills are in your particular marketplace for the kind of roles that you're interested in targeting. Um, because if you know what they are, you can align your document, your CV, your LinkedIn profile to the skills that are being sought by the marketplace. If you don't know what they are, your CV won't be as effective as you'd like it to be. Bottom line, we write CVs and therefore we know what works in the marketplace. And to prove that, um, I'm not going to read this verbatim, you can see it on the screen for yourselves. Um, we've been running these webinars for a number of months now. And um, last month we had an individual who'd attended one uh, and then we helped um, sort their CV out. They've been really struggling in the marketplace, um, as you'll see um, in the text on the screen. This particular individual had really struggled to get any attention over the last three years. A UK-based person, tough economic times in the UK, particularly over the last three to five years. Um, this person has been a victim of those tough times, but um, sorted the CV, got their LinkedIn profile sorted, but that CV started to work and make a difference. And this person started to get calls, calls to interviews, discussions about opportunities um, overnight, literally that much of a difference. So we do know what works, and we can 
make things different for people struggling in the job market. Um, this evening, I'm going to ask you to ask yourselves about your own CV and to a degree your LinkedIn profile. And this will help you determine whether you need to do anything. So there are going to be a bunch of people on this evening. There normally are cross-section of people, of course, all sorts of different walks of life, job sectors, um, types of jobs, nature of employment, some people unemployed, some people employed. But amongst all of that lot, um, there tend to be uh, three groups, crudely. Uh, there'll be a very small group, possibly containing one, two, maybe nobody actually, who actually probably don't need to do anything with their CV for reasons that will become clear very shortly. Um, there'll be some people who desperately need to do something, um, and there'll be some people, and, and they'll know it, and they'll have the stats, and they'll know that they need to do something, and there'll be some people not sure, um, for wondering whether their CV is effective. What we're going to talk about right now is some of the ways that you can ask yourself the question to try and diagnose, so self-diagnose, if you like, whether your CV is effective or not. Uh, those that are active in the job market right now or have been active very recently, this will be very easy because there'll be some things I can point you towards that will give you some pretty clear guidance on whether your CV is working or not. But it enables those who are going to be active in the job market at some stage in the future um, a little bit of a clue in terms of what you need to look out for and what you need to do on your CV and what you need to consider in determining whether your current document is strong enough or not. Once you know that, you can then do something about it or not, as the case may be. So ask yourself this, this question um, first. If you're going to market with just a list of jobs, qualifications, contact details, hobbies, interests, things like that on your CV, literally just a list of things. So you've got them laid out on the CV, bullet pointed maybe, or paragraphs of text. But in effect, all you're doing is listing things that you've done, duties and responsibilities, job titles, dates. Um, I can virtually guarantee your document is not effective as it should be. Now, a lot of people um, are surprised by this and think, well, what on earth is a CV if it isn't a list of things? And of course, at a, at a level, that's true. A CV is a list of things to some degree. But you can't just present your uh, employers, future employers and recruiters with lists of things because anybody can do that. And as most people do do that, it makes you very hard to differentiate the good from the bad when you're actually recruiting people. So if, if in effect, your CV is just a list of stuff with no real explanation, that's a danger sign. Also, if you're using a CV that in effect is exactly the same structure as it was when you left education, and this is a really big problem for those that have got a career that's sort of 5, 10, 15 years in length, if in effect you're still using a CV that was um, adopting the same format as when you left college, school, or university, again, that's a bit of a warning sign. That, that would tell me that you're not going to market with the most effective document. To be honest, even if you've just graduated, and we often have quite a few uh, recently graduated or qualified people on the webinars, the same is true really because they tend to have picked up bad habits. Either their some family members showed them a CV or they've looked on the internet and got some free advice about how a CV should be, um, not really questioned whether it's good or bad advice because their benchmark probably doesn't exist, and just then gone to market with a CV that they think is right that's still a warning sign. So, uh, But it's particularly relevant for those with a decent career history. Um, CVs evolve and change over time. And an effective CV is not one that you were using in the, eight, the 80s or the 90s or even the early noughties. Um, we're going to touch on what hot skills are um, to some degree shortly. But if you're, if, you, if you're not aligning your CV to what those hot skills are, so if you don't know what the hot skills are, unless you're very lucky, your CV will not be aligned to the marketplace. If you know what the hot skills are and you're sure about that, you can then assess whether your CV actually addresses the issues sought by the market, the um, employers and recruiters of this world or not. Um, so again, another indicator as to whether you've got a decent CV or not. And uh, second cliche of the evening, target audience. I'll be talking about target audience quite a lot. Uh, the target audience is a varied bunch of people. It's recruiters, hiring managers within the employer, junior HR people, or any intermediary between you and the employer. So it could be a number of people. It's not just one person. 
and it's not just one group of people from one um, organization. It could be a, a number of folk at different levels within different organizations, including the recruiter. Each of those people or groups have expectations when they're recruiting. And you need to make sure your document recognizes that. So if you're not positioning it for the target audience, and that's particularly true of people who, are, who could target different types of jobs, your document needs to change to reflect the needs of each of those different audiences. Talk about that a lot later this evening. Uh, bottom line from our perspective, and probably the single most important thing you should take away from this evening's session, is that you need to make sure your CV presents a business case. Um, I'll explain that in a minute as to why somebody should consider interviewing you. Now, some people say, well, okay, business case, they'll get that, they understand it. Some people say, well, what on earth is a business case? Well, a business case is a bit like a justification, um, um, some marketing collateral, a reason as to why somebody should be interested in you. So hopefully you'll, get, you'll understand that if you just present somebody with a list of things, that's not really a business case, it's just a list. Imagine if you've bought a car recently, or a boat if you're lucky enough, or a house, um, or any relatively high-priced item, it's highly unlikely you'll have been persuaded to buy that item purely because somebody thrust in front of you a list of things. So you're in the swanky BMW dealership, um, or looking online at the BMW website, you're not going to be that impressed if the, if the sole marketing message is, this car is five meters long, a couple of meters wide, meter and a half tall, um, an engine of this size, a wheelbase of that size, each wheel is such and such a diameter, that's not going to really impress you. That's not what buying a car is all about. There's no emotion, there's no justification, there's nothing there to excite. So imagine if you're presenting yourself as a product or service to the marketplace and all you're doing is providing a list of things to your target audience, don't expect them to be that impressed. Don't expect them to want to pick up the phone or drop you an email or get you in for interviewing because you'll just appear to be a rather bland offering in a marketplace that is looking for something a bit different. So aligning yourself to that sort of car analogy, you've got to talk about the emotional side of things and the proof behind what you can do. So maybe a little bit more in the, in the cars term, the BMW, they're going to be talking about miles per gallon, economy, safety, equipment levels, the benefits of what that equipment will do for you. So you've got heated seats or keep your bottom warm on a winter's day. That starts to make you think, okay, yeah, I could, could like that. Automatic lights and wipers, why it makes life easier, makes it safer. You don't have to fiddle around with many switches on the, on the car to get things to work. Now that's a benefit. Automatic transmission, yeah, that could be useful, save my left leg. It's that kind of features and benefits, and you need to treat yourself a bit like that in the marketplace. Why should somebody be prepared to interview you? Because you, you've got something to offer that employer, and that's what your CV needs to be. And we call that the business case, the justification. So unsurprisingly, bad CV is just a list of stuff. Good CV is a proper justification as to why somebody should consider interviewing you, and that's the business case. And that's the single most important thing, that if you get that right, will make a big difference to your success in the job market. Now, a lot of people ask us, either during the webinars or afterwards, or at events that we go to, what kind of success ought I expect to get if I sort my CV? So the comment at the bottom of this slide in red gives you a bit of an indication based on stats that we can collect. So this we know this because it's, CVs that we've written for our clients, um, when we've dealt with people, they're struggling in the marketplace, um, they may not know the reasons why, they come to us, we write their CV for them, they go out to the market, and on average, those individuals will get a 30 to 50% increase in the level of interviews they're getting. It can be that dramatic. There are some people, a bit like that email I showed you earlier from the chap who'd been struggling for three years, where the percentage increase is, is stratospherically above that, when it's in the hundreds of percent. Um, and there are some people who have a, a sort of a 15 to 20% increment. So it all depends, but you get your CV, your business case sorted, and you will get more success in the job market, uh, guaranteed. So another way of 
assessing whether you're getting uh, whether your current CV is performing or might perform in the marketplace um, and so uh, I think as I said to you the the most important aspect to take away from this evening is this this, uh, this idea about building a business case and we'll talk about how to do that very shortly um, another very important thing to take away depending on where you are in the job market so if you're active in the job market or have been recently active in the job market you will have the data to be able to work out uh, what we call the acid test for your CV and that acid tested its real key function in life is to get you interviews it's not to get you jobs and um, some people are still a little bit confused about that the CV's job is to get you an interview um, and from then at the interview you obviously go through a set of other processes that will lead you to be given a job offer so if you're active in the market and you've applied for 10 jobs and those 10 jobs you know you could perform so they're valid relevant jobs there might be a bit of a stretch that's fine but they're jobs that you know you could perform if you're getting 10 interviews out of the 10 applications then to be honest that's happy days your CV is doing you proud um, very rare that that happens I have to say but if that were the case then you genuinely don't need to do anything not now anyway your, your CV is doing its job if however you're not getting any interviews at all or only one or two out of those 10 applications and not enough for you to get enough activity to get to second interview to assessment center and ultimately to get job offers and I can virtually guarantee the problem is your CV and nothing else and again this is fairly controversial in the sense that a lot of people think there's all sorts of other reasons if, if there are jobs to apply for and you know that they're jobs that you could perform given the evidence available to you and you're not getting interviews for those jobs pretty much the only reason why that is is because somebody somewhere doesn't like the message you've sent them got nothing to do with you personally because they don't know you from Adam got nothing to do with the economic climate because if you've applied for a job the job exists let's assume that the jobs do exist and they're not the uh, um, fake jobs as it were most jobs are advertised and if you apply for them they that's because they exist if you're not getting the interviews it's because of the CV the message that you're sending now the difficulty is most people will give you another reason very few people will tell you to your face or over the phone or via email I'm sorry hey another you're not getting an interview because your CV is atrocious you will, will very rarely hear that unfortunately apart from people like us what you'll be told is there are better people for the job more experienced people uh, you're either overqualified underqualified um, there's a lot of competition bloody bloody blah, blah, blah all plausible reasons and to some degree they may well be true but what they mask is the fact that nobody was compelled to choose you for interview because they didn't like the message on your CV that's the harsh reality so if you if you've got these stats you can work out now you can figure out whether if you're successful in the marketplace getting enough job interviews for you to be happy um, and, and you think that will be enough to get you to the job offer stage as I say you don't need to worry about anything your CV is doing its job but if, if those stats are low and you're not getting the interviews or enough interviews to get you further on in the process I can virtually guarantee now without even seeing it the problem is your CV so if that's the case what I would stress is do something about it there are so many people a bit like that chap I mentioned to you earlier who sent us the email he'd been struggling for three years to get interest um, now unfortunately he didn't stumble across us earlier than he than he would probably have liked we didn't know about him of course but he'd been struggling for three years batting away banging his head against the wall desperately trying to get interviews and nobody in that time and we're talking about hundreds of applications nobody had told him his CV was rubbish and that was the harsh reality he was a good candidate he had good skills but he was presenting them atrociously really poorly to the marketplace so the marketplace responded by not actually interviewing him at all we sorted that message out he went to market with a far more compelling business case started getting interest as you saw so do something about it if you're suffering if you're not in the job market and you don't know how your CV is going to be formed you've got a choice you either do something about it in advance and fix the problem or keep a real close eye as you enter the job market on the statistics and as soon as you get a sense for things that aren't working quite how you'd expect 
do something about it. Don't wait. Don't kid yourself that things will materially change, because it won't, or it very rarely does, I should say. And if you're going to do something about it, two options fundamentally. You either do something yourself, and tonight will help you with what to do, or you get help, get professional help to sort it for you, a bit like that chap did earlier. OK, so let's talk a little bit now about what actually makes a good CV. So I've given you the stats and the, the insight to ask yourself some questions to figure out whether you think you've got a good CV or not. Um, let's, let's talk now about uh, what does make a good CV. And the structure you see on the screen right now is typically the sections that would make a, an effective CV. It doesn't mean to say you have to use these titles. The titles aren't important. The structure is quite important, but what's absolutely key is the content lurking behind each of these sections. Um, and we're going to talk about that um, principally tonight. The top three highlighted areas on the screen now are the three things that you really do need to get right to form this business case that I've been going on about. Now, shortly, we're going to go through those three areas. We're going to get to all of it, but the three areas highlighted in red are the ones we're going to spend most time on. You get this right, it gives you the sound foundations you need to build a business case for your CV. It also, interestingly, gives you the kind of content that you need on LinkedIn to do the same thing, to build a business case. So this is the structure broadly. Don't worry about the heading titles. The heading titles aren't going to make that much difference to whether you get an interview or not. That would be ridiculous. But this is a good kind of structure to follow. We're going to focus now on the three top areas because they're the bit that make the real business case as to why somebody should consider interviewing you. So dealing with them in turn, a lot of people will open up their CV, I guess. And again, you ask yourself this question, you'll know your own CV. If you've got some kind of opening statement, a sentence, a paragraph, um, probably no more than that. If it's any deeper than a modest paragraph, you're probably heading in the wrong direction. But if you've got that kind of opening statement, in a way that's good. We'd recommend that that's the way you go. But what you write is really important and where people get it sometimes quite wrong. In this opening statement, um, and it typically is a modest paragraph we'd recommend, you need to be describing pretty quickly to your target audience, so the recruiters or the employers or whoever's reading your CV and making a decision about you, you need to tell them what you are. Don't wait until your work experience, career history bit of the CV to explain that. Tell the person reading your CV almost instantaneously, other than who on earth you are by name, what are you? Now, the what are you varies, of course, because everybody's doing something different. But it also varies because it, you've got to get the sentiment right. So if you're an accountant, you could say you're an experienced accountant here, or senior accountant, or tax accountant, or management accountant. And that would mean something to most people. So you don't have to reflect your precise job title, particularly if you've got an odd job title. But you need to describe generically the kind of level that you're at, the position that you hold. Um, so a, um, a primary school teacher would be able to just say fairly quickly, you know, I'm a experienced primary school teacher in this particular subject or field or age group. Um, if you are an accountant, as I say, you can use fairly generic terms. But if you're um, a particular kind of salesperson um, within a particular niche, or you need to be a little bit more careful about how you describe yourself. And particularly, as I say, if you've got a very odd job title that doesn't mean anything to people outside of your uh, environment, the current environment, then you don't just reflect that. You have to, in, a, in effect, say to the reader of the CV, you're looking for this, I am that, and describe it as such, as long as you can justifiably do that. I'll show you an example shortly anyway to try and get the, the message across. But you do need to get across very quickly what you are, because you'll be up against a fair few applicants who are in no way qualified to do the job. And a lot of people forget that or don't even know that. So let's say there's 100 applicants for a particular job, which is not untypical. I can virtually guarantee 20, 25, 30 of those applicants will be in no way qualified to do the job. They'll, they'll almost be time wasted. Um, for whatever reason, they've chosen to apply, but they're not going to get any further. It's dead easy to weed them out. The trouble is, if you've got an in ineffective CV that isn't clearly stating that you're a valid applicant for the role, you could be one of the people cleared out of the system very quickly. And technically, you might actually be a good candidate for the job. That happens quite a lot, and it's quite frightening. 
and you'll very rarely get a second chance. So if you get your opening statement wrong, if it's too flowery, too wordy, not actually appealing to your target audience, you may get rejected at this stage and they'll read no further because they're wanting to get that 100 applications down to 10 that they want to interview or less very quickly. So you've got about 5 to 20 seconds of somebody's time before they start to make a decision about you. That's not enough time to read your whole CV. It's about enough time to skim read the business case that we're building about you. So what are you? Then um, where are we on cliches? Third or fourth cliche of the evening, value proposition. What is your value proposition? Crudely, that's what are you on this planet to do right now in your current employment phase. So if you're a salesperson, you're all about selling things to people either existing customers, new customers, a mix of both. If you're a, a doctor, it's all about fixing people in your area of specialism. If you're an accountant, it's about dealing with tax authorities or management accounts or whatever. But it's, it's the key reason that you exist. And if somebody's going to invest 10, 15, 50, 75,000 pounds a year in you, what is the return on that investment that you've got to offer? That's what your value proposition is. It's the, it's the area of key strength that you have that's worth somebody investing your salary. We'll look at an example, as I say, shortly. And then link to that a handful of things you're particularly good at. So most people who've got a career tend to be um, capable of doing two, three, maybe four things really well, either because of their knowledge, uh, up in their grey matter or technical knowledge or software capabilities or market understandings but describe what you're good at and then you align those with the hot skills in the marketplace so if the market's looking for X, Y and Z you make sure that this opening statement as long as you can justify it explains that you're good at X, Y and Z you don't pick A, B, C just because you think that's what you enjoyed the most because that's not what the market is looking for the market's looking for X, Y, Z so if you've got that in your toolkit, make sure this opening statement is reflecting those skills to your target audience. On screen now is an example, um, which again, I'm not going to read. You can look at it yourself whilst I um, uh, rabbit on a bit. Um, but this is typically the kind of text that would appear at the top of a CV that we would be writing for an individual to start building their business case as to why somebody should interview them or consider interviewing them. Now, I stress, you'll look at this and some people will say, yeah, but I'm not a finance director, I'm not a senior individual, it's too, it's too professional. Forget about that. Everybody at any level, I guarantee it, supermarket checkout operators, um, right away up to CEOs of global corporations, everybody in any role working in any company or having just graduated um, can write something like this about themselves. So it's what are you? They're a finance director. What's the value proposition? It's, it's a surrounding the protecting cash flow and profitability statement. What are they good at? There's a list of things. Are they aligned to the hot skills in the marketplace? Well, we have to assume so because we don't know who the individual is and we don't know what the employer is looking for. But but it looks feasible. It looks it looks like a good strong rationale as to why somebody should be considering them. Now, if you consider, if you do open your CV with some kind of statement like this just start to think, Do I am I talking about things, anything like this? And, and in most cases, I can virtually guarantee you're not, because what most people tend to say is, I'm enthusiastic, dedicated, passionate, I can work well as in a team uh, or as an individual, um, I've got great interpersonal skills, I'm committed, I give 110%, um, I'm really looking to do this, that. So it's lots of I, I, I. Um, and the major error, though, is lots of behavioural terms. So if you look at the, the thing that's on screen now, this opening professional summary, everything that you see there could then be proven on the CV at a later stage uh, by way of examples. If you are talking about enthusiasm, dedication, passion, ability to work in a team or as an individual or any of those other things, you can't prove any of that on your CV. If you can, you deserve a medal. I've not seen anybody do it ever in my time. And that's the problem. If you can't prove it on the CV, how on earth do you expect anybody to believe what you're saying or to take it at face value and just give you an interview because you've said it on your CV? 
So a lot of people get confused here and they think, well, okay, I'm writing, I'm applying for jobs and they've asked for people who have got a you know, dynamism and enthusiasm and, a, and, and have got good interpersonal skills. So I have to put those on my CV. That means I'm, I'm addressing the skills they're looking for, forgetting that the point at which they assess you for those skills and qualities is much later in the process. So from the CV, people will judge certain characteristics. They'll be looking for evidence of your ability to do the job. That's what will decide whether you get an interview or not. At interview, you'll be judged on enthusiasm, commitment possibly, um, interpersonal skills, communication skills, gravitas, all of those other wonderful things. So they are valuable attributes. Nobody in their right mind is going to want to recruit people who aren't enthusiastic and committed and will give 110%. Of course they will. But the CV is not the time they make that judgment call. It's much later on in the process. To get the interview, you've got to present a strong business case as to why they should be interviewing you. And that's all about the technical and functional skills that you have with proof to back it up. So ask yourself this, if there's anything on your CV, particularly in this opening statement, that you can't then prove on the CV, get rid of it because it's harming you. I guarantee it, it's harming you because you look like virtually all of the other applicants and therefore there's a risk of you being rejected quite quickly. So that's a really important piece of opening statement. It's, and most people get this hideously wrong for the reasons I've described, but if you get this right, automatically the reader of your CV is starting to think, hallelujah, here's somebody who's taken the time to imagine what we're really looking for and would seem to be a valid applicant. I'm now going to read a bit further. I'm going to give this person a little bit more time. And then we move on to the second of the three areas that are really important, which is a key skills or expertise area. And there are two real benefits of this, one of which allows you to put on your CV bullet-pointed key skills, which I'll show you some in a minute, that reflect what that employer or opportunity or recruiter are looking for. The second benefit, so that's a visual benefit if you like, the second benefit is that if you get this content right, it makes your document far easier to search. <coughs> Excuse me. So the SEO comment here is search engine optimization. So as soon as your CV leaves your outbox and hits uh, a job board or a recruiter's system or an employer system is going to get put on a database of some sort and they're going to store that information so they might look at your CV straight away as part of an application process but your CV is just as likely to be spotted by people if you've got the coding and the keywords right by folk looking for good strong candidates in a particular marketplace so you want to make sure your CV is appearing more often than not in those kind of database searches and if you get if, if you get the keywords wrong or if you don't use enough of them on your CV, you won't appear in as many searches as you'd like. So you may get totally ignored for opportunities rather than considered. So here's just a few. Um, again, these have a bit of a financial bent, but that's not important. Anybody, again, anywhere at any level can conjure up a number of key skills. Now, this is a combination of, of things that you've got in your toolkit of skills that you've acquired through work or education or whatever linked to what are the employers actually looking for. So you match them as best you can. So this is an area you customize depending on the application you're making. So it varies from application to application. That's quite important. They ought not to stay fixed. And you'll notice again, they're functional or technical skills and also every single one of these could be proven on the CV if we chose to do so. So the warning signs here is if you've got any bullet pointed key skills or areas of expertise or competencies on your CV that are behavioral, so enthusiasm, dedication, attention to detail, um, that's a bit of an interesting one. Attention to detail is normally, um, that can be proven on your CV normally negatively because people who put that on the CV then normally make a mistake later on and that just reinforces the fact that you don't actually have any attention to detail at all and you'll be rejected straight away. So be very careful. If you put attention to detail on your CV, that actually can be proven, but as I say, normally in the wrong way. Um, so focus on the technical and functional skills that the employer is looking for, not behavioral skills. 
Now, the comment at the bottom of this slide, uh, before we look at the real-life example of a CV, just to give you an idea about how, how all of this fits together, is really important. Um, and I sort of hinted at this earlier. It's that the vast majority of recruiters and hiring managers make their decision on who to interview solely based on the contents of your CV. And you think, you may think, well, that sounds fairly obvious. Um, and that's the point. A lot of the people, for some strange reason, think that they'll send their CV in for an application, that that will magically get them an interview, and at that interview they'll be able to fill in all the gaps that they knew that were on the CV, um, but didn't want to put, or couldn't be bothered to put, or couldn't find the right words to put. Now those people tend not actually to get the interviews, so they don't get the opportunity to talk about all these things that should have been on the CV. And so the poor old recruiter or hiring manager, if you have any sympathy for them, can only make a decision based on what you send them. So if you send them rubbish, the output and the outcome and the result is likely to be bad for you. If you send them really good, compelling content, you're likely to get more interviews. They have no crystal ball. They can't look into their crystal ball and say, ah, oh, I have this CV. It's not a very good CV, but I can imagine because I have this you know, mystical power that the individual is actually going to be right for my client or for our business. That just doesn't happen. You send them a bunch of rubbish, they'll judge you on that basis, you won't get an interview, end of. I'm sorry to be quite harsh about that, and it is fairly controversial, but it is the harsh reality. If you go and sit with a recruiter and watch them go through the application process, it's brutal, particularly in the current climate with lots of applicants for most roles, and they will only pay attention to CVs that seem to give them the right indicators. Okay, I promise I'd look, uh, or rather show you an example of a, a real life CV. So just appearing on the screen right now ought to be um, a CV for a chap called Matt Craven. Matt Craven runs our business, it's his CV, it's real content. Um, and you can see that in building Matt's business case, he's got an opening statement, it's describing what he is what his value proposition is, the things that he's good at, and we're assuming, again, that's aligned to the hot skills if he were job seeking. He's then got an, a, an area that he's called exp expertise, and that contains some bullet points. Probably that's about as many as you'd want. I think he's got seven down the left-hand side, seven down the right, so 14 in total. That's about as many as you'd want. Any more than that starts to look a bit too many. Uh, and a bit hard to assess. We'd say between 10 and 14 is the, the magic kind of number. So between 5 and 7 on the left, 5 and 7 on the right. And you'll notice they're two or three word, possibly four word statements. They're all functional or technical. Uh, there's nothing there that can't be proven. If we wanted to prove it, um, by way of examples, as we'll soon see later in the session, um, and they would work well in a search engine situation as well because they're the phrases that people tend to look for. You'll notice also, um, for reasons we'll come on to later, that all there is at the top of Matt CV is his name and some contact details. Interestingly, there's nothing on there about where he lives, deliberately so, we'll talk about that later, and so far there's no real clue in terms of who he works for or where he's worked career-wise. That's very deliberate, as we'll soon see. OK, so that's the two areas um, out of three that we've talked about so far that I said were important in terms of building a business case. Opening statement, bullet-pointed key skills. So the third area, um, given that we've now made some claims about you, or in this case, Matt on his CV, um, but whoever CV it is, we're making some claims, we're saying, this is what I am, this is what I'm good at, here's the skills that I have, and you, if you're harsh, you could say, okay, well, where's the proof? And that's, that's the next bit. So career highlights is a section that we have on the CVs we write for our clients, um, which provides the evidence to support the claims that have just been made. Not every single one of them necessarily, but the ones that are relevant to your target audience. Now, because it's about proof and evidence, it means that you need to be good at writing content about yourself. And at this point, some people throw up their hands and say, uh, I really hate this. I mean, it's bad enough writing a CV, but having to try and think of things that are relevant about me and my achievements and highlights of my career, I really hate doing this. So I'd say if, if genuinely you really don't like writing CVs, 
then get realistic about it and, and start thinking about getting help. The worst thing you can do is don't do anything. Don't give it just five minutes on a Sunday afternoon and think that will do. It won't, I'm afraid, in today's marketplace. So if this is a thing that doesn't come naturally to you, then start seriously considering getting help in the nicest possible way. If you're good at writing about yourself, uh, and I'll show you how you do this very shortly, then fine, give it a go, see how you get on. So the writing ability is really important. Now we use a methodology when we're writing career highlights on these CVs that we call STAR. It's, um, it's a fairly well known acronym. There are versions of it with slightly different letters in different places, but this is quite a nice one because it's easy to remember. Um, STAR stands for Situation, Task, Actions and Result. And it's a way of um, deconstructing complex events, projects, achievements, um, assignments, if you like, um, and then reconstructing them using this methodology to make a nice, concise piece of text explaining something that you're involved with as an individual. It's also interesting, if you get good at this, it's a really good way of handling competency-based uh, interviews and questions because you can give people examples. So when, they, when you're asked those questions, uh, please give us an example of when you did this or when you experienced that or when you had a tricky situation. If you get very good at this methodology, you can make sure your answer fits into these compartments, the star compartments, if you like, um, and give a nice concise answer without waffling on for ages and ages and then, and then losing the plot. I'll show you an example. So this is a career highlight. It would appear on the CV. We typically look to have three of these on a typical CV. Um, and it's giving evidence to support the claims that the individual made for themselves earlier on on their CV. Again, I'm not going to read this. You can look at it yourself. But the first sentence is the situation. So it is that an IRAC stands for Enterprise Rent-A-Car, by the way. So uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car acquired a business that needed sorting out. That's the situation, the headline, the seed letter, if you like. The task is the sentence starting appointed. It's the responsibility resting on the shoulders of this particular individual. So at this moment in time, when they were enterprise rent a car, they were appointed operations manager to do things to sort the business out, basically. The actions are the things that this individual did. So it's a list of stuff. Uh, and then the result is the final sentence. So it's, this individual succeeded in rebranding the business, achieving a certain level of profitability within a certain time scale. So it's nice, punchy um, result, conclusion. So anybody reading that, you don't need to know the detail. They don't need to know the detail. There's enough there to say, OK, I can understand what was going on here. I can understand what your role was within this situation. I can see the things that you did, or the key things that you did, not necessarily everything. Um, and I can see that it had an, a, a, you know, a meaningful impact on the world, uh, or at the very least on the Enterprise Rent-A-Car. So that sounds quite impressive. And that demonstrates some of the things that you've claimed earlier on in your CV. So that's really helpful. Thank you very much, Mr. or Mrs. Candidate. This is actually off Matt's CV. He, he really did do this in his distant past. So that's a really good example. Now, again, some people may look at that and think, yeah, but I, I don't do that kind of thing. I, don't, I, I can't make money or save money. That's not the point. Um, even if you've just graduated and you have no career to speak of, you can actually switch the emphasis and say, OK, what's the target audience looking for? Or with a fresh graduate, what they're looking for is evidence of certain competencies, project management, for example. Um, project management may be that you arranged a student union gig uh, at some point in your life, or that you arrange sponsorship for a particular event or activity, um, or you have a particular interest, hobby or interest, which demands organizational skills or project management to get people in the right place at the right time, maybe you know, like a football club or a hockey club or a netball club or whatever club, and that you are the leader of that, the captain of it, whatever. You can always look at things from the, a different angle for the individual concerned. So don't worry about whether you have a job that has given you immense world-changing powers or not. That's, not. that's not the point. The point is, we always look to individuals and say, OK, tell us about what you've been up to. Tell us about what you're interested in. Tell us about what you're trying to do. From that, we can then assess, OK, well, you're likely to have done this kind of thing um, or experienced that. Tell us more about that. And we unearth from people the kind of things that we need to build these career highlights. But they're really important and form the final part of building this business case or 
final part of the most important section of the CV, the, the first three sections that I talked about. Some warning signs though on these career highlights, pick good examples. So if you pick bad examples, they look weak to the reader and, and that will make you look worse than you ought to. So don't just pick things that you were interested in because they felt the best to you. They were the things that you were most interested in. That's not the point. You've got to imagine what the target audience is actually looking for and then present to them the evidence that best fits those demands or expectations. So they have to be relevant and targeted as well as as powerful as they can be. Um, it doesn't matter if you've got a job that has been able to affect change, great. But if you haven't, if you're in a fairly menial, as far as you might describe it, administrative job, and you don't feel that you've changed the world recently, don't worry about that. We just focus on the things that you've done that actually still demonstrate that you're good at what you do. And your target audience is likely to just want evidence of that. So it might be that you've processed the payroll on time for 10 years consecutively every single month. Um, it might be that you're pretty good at liaising with um, tax authorities, the HMRC in the UK. It might be that you're really good at teaching a certain level of uh, individual and taking them from uh, point A to point B. It might be that you've got a good track record of recruiting people and then training them and getting them promoted within the business. And you may take that all for granted, but they're actually skills that can be presented to your target audience very effectively. And as I've indicated, this is probably where we spend most of the time with our clients talking and extracting information from them that helps build these highlights. But they're really important. Let me show you Matt's CV with the highlights on it. And what you see on screen now, imminently, as it refreshes, that is in effect the three sections we've been talking about, I've been talking about. Um, and that forms the large part of uh, Matt's business case as to why somebody should be considering interviewing him. So you've got exec summary, bullet pointed key skills, three career highlights. And if you notice, the middle one of those three career highlights is the enterprise rent car example we just talked about. The beauty of this is that I think with one exception where Matt's put a date in there um, because it references when he started his current business. But you don't need to date or reference time in these career highlights. They're, they're in no chronological order. They're in order of relevance to the target audience. So if, something, if you've got a reasonably long career, let's say 15, 20 years of doing something, and there still is something from 15 years ago that's really important and relevant to what makes you tick, it means you can get it onto the first page of your CV where it's relevant and fresh and can be seen and forms a part of your business case rather than waiting for the typical chronological order of things to un, uh, uh, um, unfold and display it there on page two or three of your CV, where to be honest, it may never get noticed. So it's a really good way of bringing forward the, the important evidence that proves you're capable of doing what you want to be doing in the future. So that's, that's the three major sections of a CV. You get that bit right, that's the bit that will make the biggest difference. Some of the other sections on the CV, um, uh, because of course what we haven't talked about yet is where on earth, in this case, Matt got his experience from, his career history. So again, I'll come back to his CV shortly to show you how it's sort of um, is structured. But of course, at some point, we do need to talk about career history, the, the experience that in this case Matt's got. Now, a lot of people on tonight will probably open up much earlier on their CV than they perhaps should do. So if you're currently opening your CV and you're virtually going straight into your career history, that's not good because you're not building a business case. You're just opening up and saying to people, wham, bam, this is me, my name, this is maybe where I live, and this is my work experience. And you've lost control then because if the reader of your CV doesn't like who you've worked for, doesn't know who you've worked for, doesn't recognize the name, or if they do recognize it, it conjures up negative pictures in their mind. You've lost them straight away. You've, you've sent them on a negative trail, and there's a chance you might get rejected, simply because you weren't presenting a nice, logical flow of information to the reader. A nice flow is, this is what I'm capable of doing. In effect, I'm a valid applicant for this role. Here are the things I'm good at, which I know you're going to be interested in. Here are the skills I've got, which I know are relevant to your client or you as an employer. 
here's some proof to back it up, which I know you're going to be interested in because virtually nobody does that currently, so that's going to stand out. Oh, and by the way, this is where I've accumulated that skill from. Here's my work experience. That's a nice, logical, controlled flow. In an ideal world, you know, we can't legislate that everybody will read it that way, but most people do. Most people will skim the first page, desperately looking for evidence that you're a valid applicant with the right skills. So present that to them on your CV. Don't dive straight into education. That's not a differentiator for most people. Don't dive straight into or quite quickly into your work history because that's not a differentiator either. That's just a list of stuff. But when you do get to the career history, it is important that it is on page one of the CV, but down near the bottom is quite tolerable, and that's exactly where it's going to land up on our CVs, as you'll soon, soon see. You do work in reverse chronological order. Most people get that right, so you start with your most recent or current role and work backwards. But don't, if you've got a career that's more than 10 years long, don't detail everything. You will not get interviews based on what happened in the 90s, the 80s, the 70s, or even the 60s. It's just not going to happen, with very few exceptions. So only provide a bit of detail about the last roughly 8 to 10 years, and always make sure you're drawing that line differently as time marches on. Provide a little bit of background about your role, some duties and responsibilities, but not many. They're shared by everybody with a similar job title and function to you. So if, if all you're doing is presenting, a, in effect, your job description to the world, guess what? Most other applicants are doing exactly the same. How on earth is anybody to decide whether you're any better or worse than them at those responsibilities? Well, the way to do that is to show what you've actually achieved in life. What have you done with those responsibilities that makes you, you? So focus on the achievements, not what you're paid to do. After the last eight to ten years, so you've provided a bit of detail, and I'll show you Matt's example shortly, for your earlier career, if you have an earlier career. So for anything for these days, I guess you're looking for sort of 2002, certainly the turn of the millennium, anything in the 90s and 80s, just a line, literally from this date to that date, employer name, job title, end of, nothing more. Then later on in the CV, again, than most people tend to put it, detail your qualifications, continual professional development, training courses, professional development, that sort of thing. That, that needs to be further back in the CV. If you're a graduate, you can mention that in your professional summary. You can say a degree educated um, or a graduate engineer um, or something like that. If you've got an MBA, you can mention that in the professional summary, MBA educated professional business development manager or whatever. You don't need to detail all of your qualifications on the first page of your CV because that, in most cases, is not differentiating enough. Surprisingly, for a lot of people, personal details, other than your name and how people can get hold of you quickly, shunt it to the back of the CV. Don't have your address necessarily on page one. It's not that that's the most tedious crime, but a lot of people take up way too much space with personal details that aren't relevant. They're not building your business case. Where you live is not part of your business case, uh, in very few cases anyway. In fact, there's some evidence to suggest that where you live could be a problem, um, and you'll get rejected because somebody looks at the postcode and thinks, well, there's no way in God's earth we want somebody commuting that far, or they'll, they'll imagine you wouldn't relocate, or they'll conjure up all sorts of pictures in their mind before they've even figured out that you're a relevant candidate for the job. So again, don't give people evidence that might work against you. So we recommend putting most of the personal information towards the back of the CV. And then uh, an area that, again, most people tend not to use or they use it in the wrong way. If you're going to put on your CV references available on request, which 90% of you will probably will be doing or something like that, ask yourself what on earth is that doing um, other than taking up a bit of space? Because if a recruiter or, sorry, an employer, more to the point, has got a policy um, when they make job offers to seek references. It doesn't matter whether you've got them available uh, on request or not. They're going to ask for them. That's part of the process. So the statement references available on request, unless you're asked for them as part of the application, it's a, it's a wholly pointless exercise. Far better, provide some testimonial evidence. Get some If you've got a LinkedIn account with a recommendation on it, and it's an appropriate one, which we'll talk about later, get that on your CV. Seek some testimonial evidence from somebody that's managed you or employed you in the past. Far more effective uh, at building your business case. And then finally, and again fairly controversially, hobbies and interests. Most people put them on their CV 
our recommendation is only put ones on your CV if they build your business case. So that applies to somebody who's trying to make a case that they've got a passion for something, a real deep knowledge of it, fine. You can talk about maybe an interest you've got. Or if you're desperately trying to move sector, so you're in a particular environment now, you want to move, you don't have any commercial experience within that sector, but your hobby and passion is that particular subject matter, fine, that could help you. That could help build your business case. But there are a lot of other things that will be harshly judged. You might be harshly judged by so supporting the wrong football club or, or getting involved in lots of what might be perceived as solitary pursuits. Um, those things can harm your chances without you even realizing it just because of the view of somebody on the other end of the process. And that it might be a misguided view, but it creates a picture in their mind. So don't make it easy for people to think anything other than positive things about you. So briefly, a moment of reflection. The first thing I want to do is just go back to Matt's CV and, um, and show you how, first of all, the first page of his CV looks like. So on screen now, getting ever and ever smaller, I'm afraid, but what you see on screen now is page one, the entire page one of Matt's CV. So you can see the three sections we talked about, building the business case, then down at the bottom of page one, career history, who he works for, what his role is, the date, bit of an explanation about who on earth the company that he works for is. Never assume that people know who you work for. Always provide some kind of explanation, even if you work for a big brand. Because otherwise people can conjure up all sorts of things in their mind and they may get it wrong. And that might work for you and it might work against you. So provide a bit of explanation. And then if we go on to page two of the CV, which will be appearing any time soon, you can see quite a lot more information about Matt's current role. Um, so a bit of background, a bit of his team, what it consists of, things he's involved with. So if you like the duties and responsibilities bit, but balanced by then a whole pile of key achievements, things that he's actually done, which couldn't be attributed to anybody else. Then you'll see at the base of page two, um, another role that he had. Um, with a bit of information, and then, oops, sorry. and then finally page three of the CV, we'll talk about number of pages later, because that, that is a question that often crops up, how many pages you have on your CV, deal with that later, but for now, page three of Matt's CV, you can see earlier career, top third of page three, just one-liners for his earlier career. But notice, we featured Enterprise Rent-A-Car. We drew out a case study, put it on page one, even though it happened quite a long time ago in Matt's career. That's the beauty of using those career highlights. You're not forced to have to wait until you get round to the Enterprise Rent-A-Car section to explain the good stuff he did there, which probably would never get read, read, read by anybody. Then education, personal detail, and some recommendations. So people in fairly senior positions saying good things about Matt. That is really, really useful if you've got it. If you haven't, don't worry about it. Not everybody has. But wholly more productive than references available on request, which is almost pointless. OK, so that's, um, that's Matt's CV. Um, may come back to it later if anybody's interested, but um, it gives you an idea of the format. Um, now, I've been asking a number of questions during the evening and suggesting, okay, you need to work out where you are and where you think your CV may be. So you should now have a reasonable grasp on, if, you, if you're not getting the interviews, if you're active in the market, of course, assuming you're active in the market, if you're not getting the interviews you feel you deserve or any interviews at all, then, of course, you can, think, you can start to think, hmm, I do have a problem. Um, the second stat, if you're active in the marketplace, you'll have the the figures to back this up, that's more importantly. If you're applying for jobs and not getting interviews, your CV is a problem. I can virtually guarantee it. I've yet to meet anybody where that, that situation is not true. Um, so that's, that's a warning sign. And the reason you're probably not getting the interviews is because you're not providing a business case to your target audience to why they should be interested in interviewing you. And that's probably because there isn't that much relevant ed evidence on your CV to compel somebody to pick up the phone, send you an email, or get you to interview. 
And if you're not active in the job market and you think any of those things might be true, it's at least giving you a bit of a clue that you might need to be doing something. So then you've got a decision. If the stats tell you you're getting loads of interviews and you're happy with that, you don't need to do anything because if you're getting seven, eight, nine, ten interviews out of the ten applications, you're not going to be able to improve much on that, whatever you do. So call it quits and, and happy days, as I said earlier. But for most people, they're not in that uh, group, unfortunately. So as I suggested, you can then decide to follow what we talked about this evening and what we're about to talk about on LinkedIn. Do something yourself, and that's fine. And then you can measure the impact. And then option three, which we'll talk about uh, soon as well, is getting help. And obviously, we'd rather like you to choose us if you're going to go down that path. And if you do, one of the things that Talent Spire encourages us to do is offer people who um, suffered one of these webinars a really good deal at the end so that it eases the financial burden because I'm afraid if you do seek professional help most like uh, other things in life it, it costs money but some great discounts around later um, which I'll explain to help uh, make that slightly more palatable just a few bits I'm not going to mention all of these but I promise to touch on a couple of things here uh, one in particular um, you may have noticed looking at Matt's CV um, there's nothing particularly wacky about it in terms of the fonts or the colorings or the or any crazy use of technology that's not the point it's all about the content so if you're good at writing content you'll find it easier to do something yourself if you're not good at that I, I'd say strongly consider getting help because it makes such a big difference number of pages um, is often asked of us and and people say I've been told this I've been told that most of the CVs we write for our clients are either two or three pages long, but some are four pages. We have never had anybody come back and tell us that we provided them with a document that was not the right size, be that too little or too large. Never, never, never. The only exceptions to the rule of don't worry about the pages is if somebody specifically asks you to submit a document that's X number of pages long, and then of course you should adhere to that demand. But that rarely happens. And this sort of urban myth slash old wives tale about a CV should be typically two pages long is mainly driven by the fact that what people don't like is poor content. So in a desperate attempt to try and restrict the amount of stuff people have to look at, this sort of myth has gone around that it should be two pages because people can't face reading three or four pages of drivel. Um, so that's, that's crudely how it's come about. So unless you're asked to submit a document of a certain length, don't worry about how long your CV is within reason. And as I say, most of ours probably are in the three-page realm, um, and they work a treat as long as the content's sound. LinkedIn, finally. Um, so LinkedIn's very important um, for a number of reasons. But if you remember earlier, I said that the vast majority, I think it was 92% of recruiters and hiring managers on average, will judge you purely on the contents of your CV. Uh, for those mathematicians amongst you, the difference between 100% and 92% are folk that may already know you, so a recruiter that might have seen you before, so they can, they can decide whether to interview you or not literally by thinking about you rather than looking at a CV, or where somebody's referred you to an individual. So somebody might have said, you ought to see Joe Blogs because they're really good. So that's the 8%. It's not many, but a few people benefit from that luxury of, of being known about. Um, of that 92%, so the vast majority of the other recruiters and hiring managers, they've looked at your CV, they've made the decision based on that. If they're thinking about interviewing you, interviewing you, the vast majority of those people will then go and check you out on LinkedIn and probably on other social media platforms, to be honest, as well, this day and age. But things like Facebook and Twitter are out with this evening's session, and they're not regarded as professional business-like things. They're just an area where you could actually cause yourself a lot of grief if you've been particularly um, deviant, if that's the right word, on Facebook or Twitter in traditional social media. But as far as LinkedIn's concerned, it's a professional business network. People want to suss you out and see whether you have a presence, and if you have, what is it looking like? So it's important for those looking for jobs of course, because it gives you an opportunity to raise your profile. It gives you an opportunity to look for jobs on LinkedIn. Of course, LinkedIn is actually earning more revenues from job placements, or sorry, I should say job advertisements, than it is subscriptions. 
and so um, it's becoming a really big pool of talent and they're really leveraging that to their advantage. But it's also important for people who think they might be, which is most people, active in the job market or needing to find something else in the middle distance or even the longer distance. So if you're not on LinkedIn right now and you think it might be useful, I'd get on it sooner rather than later and start building your profile, the awareness, the content, because it will pay you back in spades later on in life. If you are on it, make sure you're on it well, the content is good, and that you um, get it aligned to the things you want to do in the future. Again, it will pay you dividends. But it is different from your CV. A lot of people just copy and paste the CV content. And whilst that's not, again, a hideous crime, um, or I should say, it's not it's not a crime if the content's okay, um, but even with our content. So if we'd written a CV for you, we wouldn't just copy and paste the content into LinkedIn. It doesn't work like that. Um, most people do that, but that doesn't mean to say it's right. If you've got a poor CV and you're copying and pasting into LinkedIn, guess what? You've got a poor LinkedIn profile. And what a lot of people seem to do is they have a bit of a mishmash. So they have a CV or a number of CVs, they have a LinkedIn profile, and then there are great gaps between the two. And they'll get spotted a mile off, and they can cause some people some real grief because you'll get rejected at the final stage. So your CV may have actually got you the interview key, and then somebody looked at your LinkedIn profile and thought, hang on a minute, this is all different. Now, if you're lucky, somebody will pick up the phone and say, why, why the difference? What's going on here? If you're unlucky, they'll just say, can't be bothered, reject, move on. LinkedIn encourages you, if you've ever set up a profile or familiar with LinkedIn, it encourages you to um, fill out loads of forms um, and boxes and areas, you know, education, um, schools, qualifications, certifications, um, employment history, photographs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It encourages you to do that. And if you know LinkedIn quite well, you'll know that you get a score on your profile depending on how much information you've stuffed into it. So it leads you to believe that the more information you put in, the better in speech marks your profile is. That's actually also a load of rubbish in the great scheme of things because um, I could stick a photograph of a monkey on my LinkedIn profile and I'd still get a slight, slightly better score than not having a photograph. And plainly, that can't be right. Um, so it applies to content as well. You could ram all sorts of content into the boxes that LinkedIn will allow you to fill in, but it could be gibberish within reason, and it would still say, ha-ha, this box has been ticked, your profile is now super-duper. Whatever your level of profile has no real bearing on whether people are going to notice you and decide to interview you. It's the content that's vital. So less is more is the ideal maxim to follow. Don't feel obliged to stuff LinkedIn full of information. That, that will magically make you more appealing to your audience. It won't. It actually could cause you more harm than good. It's far more appropriate and important to focus on the content, just like on your CV. Get the message right. Don't worry about box ticking and filling all the forms. The key things. So I mentioned that on the CV there were three key things, remember? The opening statement, the key skills in bullet points, and the career highlights. Those are the three key things. LinkedIn's a bit similar three most important things to get right um, and to focus and put time into is the professional headline. I'll show you what that is in a minute because not everybody knows what that is. And the summary. And then there's another one later that we'll look at. Professional headline, if you uh, take a look at the screen now, you'll see Matt's uh, LinkedIn profile. The professional headline is the bit just under his name, which I've loosely ovaled in red. So what a lot of people go is LinkedIn default which is your job title, or most recent title, and your employer. If you've got an odd job title, or if you've got a job title that you're trying to escape from and develop yourself and move ahead, leading your LinkedIn profile with the least differentiating piece of information or something that's not actually going to help your cause is, of course, almost commercial suicide. So don't do it. Change the professional headline, that bit of text under your name, to something more meaningful. Crudely, it's your value proposition. So in this case, Max value proposition that he can drive success in the job market for individuals and corporations interested in that. That's what he's on this planet to do. So put some words in there that reflect your value proposition. Don't just state the obvious, which is your job title and employer, because that may not be selling yourself very well. The summary is the overall bit now. That's the bit of text underneath the main header. 
it's a bit like the professional summary on your CV, but the tense changes, I haven't got time to go into why, but trust me, that this is one of the differences between the CV and the LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn, you can talk about, I did this, I did that. It just makes sense. It's just right. On the CV, it doesn't. A um, lot of reasons for that. As I say, I don't really have the time to go into that. Um, but that, that's why you need to approach the two subtly differently. As far as positions or jobs that you have um, and putting them on LinkedIn, just put summaries. So remember, Matt's CV had quite a lot of detail about his current role. You don't want to copy and paste that into LinkedIn. It's just too much. It's not what it's there for. And in fact, that there are certain limitations on how much text you can put in some of the boxes. So just a brief snippet um, and a, a bit of a hook for people. That's all you need. And the third area. So I mentioned on LinkedIn, professional headlines important. Summary is important to build a business case. And then another area, which most people don't even know exists, let alone use, is called projects. And projects is a really useful area. So if you go into a LinkedIn profile, if you have one, click on the edit profile option. You'll get a screen like mine on the screen right now. And then somewhere down that right-hand side, depending on how much content you've already filled, there'll be the, uh, an option called projects. So you click on that, you'll get a screen that looks a bit like this. Projects is a great area for displaying uh, evidence of your success and abilities. So it's this is where you can actually take the career highlights that we've put on the CV and dump them straight into your LinkedIn profile. This is an area that copy and paste does work really well. So a project is a career highlight or an event or an achievement. You can give it a punchy name, and we would suggest you do. So then just put something boring like um, you know, launched a new payroll system into my employer. Um, you want to put something like you know, new software that saved truckload of money or words to that effect, something punchy. You can link the project then to a job that you had, and then you put the star career highlight using a star methodology off the CV and put it into this box here, the description of the project. They then appear on your profile. They provide the evidence to back up um, things that you've done. It makes your business case stronger. Finally, in regards to LinkedIn, um, the sections that you have in a LinkedIn profile, so the summary is one, your experience is another, skills and expertise is another, project is another, all of those sections can be reordered. It operates on drag and drop. Again, a lot of people don't realize that. So you can reposition the sections to build your business case. Don't necessarily go with the default setting. Good content in the default setting is better than nothing at all, but you can reorder the sections to make a stronger business case for people looking at your profile. Okay, um, we're almost done in the sense of the content. Now, just for those people, and there's always a few people who are starting to think, okay, well, this guy's told us a whole heap of stuff, might have a go myself, might seek professional help, or actually, there's no way on earth I'm going to do it myself, I am going to seek professional help. If you do go down that route, just very briefly, so you understand the complexity, so th these things aren't the work of the moment. If, if you want us, for example, to rewrite your CV and LinkedIn profile to build a business case, and we do that from scratch, we don't amend things, we don't tweak things, you can't do that, it's actually technically impossible. You've either got a CV that works or you haven't, and if you haven't, it needs sorting from the root and branch level. So we rewrite everything from scratch, and if we do that, the way we get that information out of you is that we spend a couple of hours with you on telephone or Skype or whatever, extract all the raw data from you in the nicest possible way. Um, and actually, it's quite fun. It's quite a cathartic process, strangely. And then we use that information to clarify what you're trying to do and make sure that it's a you know, valid reason and, and do a sanity check on it. If you don't know it, we'll help work out what your value proposition is and how you should present that to the masses. We will discuss with you and determine what is important and not important from your career and work up those achievements so that, in effect, you can go to market with a really strong business case as to why somebody should be interviewing you. And as we've now seen, if you've got a stronger business case, it will secure you more interviews. Um, and on average, that's a 30 to 50% increment, so you can work that out whether that's valuable or not. And interestingly, it also allows people to go for bigger jobs. Not mass, you, know, you can't go from supermarket checkout operator to nuclear submarine captain in one go. We're never going to be help, able to help you with that, nor is anybody else on this planet. But it can get you from, say, 
junior to senior or middle to senior or senior to exec or exec to director. It can help you make those moves by presenting the business case as to why that should be happening. So it can leverage better salaries. Now, if it can do all those things, you can do the maths then. You can say, I'm thinking about it. Is it worth to me? If I got a job two weeks quicker, what's that worth to me in money? If I got a job a month quicker, what's that worth? If I got a bigger job that pays me three grand more a year, what's that worth to me apart from the three grand? You can do the maths. And if that's the case, then you can work out whether this special offer actually makes sense or not, and whether you should take advantage of it. Now, if you came to us as an individual out with this webinar, and you have more than five to seven years experience, the normal price to get a CV rewritten um, is 299 plus VAT. The LinkedIn profile is 50 quid plus VAT. So that's 349 quid plus VAT. So we know it's not it's not just a, a snap decision you make in terms of money. It's a lot of money, but it's a lot of work. We'll do both of those things for you, though, for 275 plus VAT. So you're saving an awful lot of cash. So you can work out whether that's a valuable option or not. However, there's a catch, and the catch is this is a time-limited deal, and it's time-limited to close of play next Monday, the 17th. And those that order, um, and there'll be some that order straight away, and there'll be some that think about it and order later, but the first 10 people that go down that route, if you're interested, you'll also get a free cover letter and access to our interview coaching platform, which is a really nifty piece of kit that allows you to practice interviews in the privacy of your own home without anybody peering over your shoulder. Very, very useful if the next stage of the process bothers you, you want to practice your skills. Now, to get access to that offer, what you have to do is visit a website, which I've just put on the screen, and I will now copy and paste, because I don't think you can actually click on it if you're inclined to do so via your, um, your screen. So just bear with me whilst I zap this into um, the chat facility. And also, uh, just bear with me, whoever asked the last question, Johnny, I'm just going to jump on board your um, question and zap into there, that's the link that takes you to the uh, relevant website. Um, also on that website, just so you know, um, there's a DIY pack, for want of a better word, but um, you can buy some bits and pieces off our website for 18 quid, including the VAT, some templates, a workbook, an interview ebook, which gives you a few hints and tips. So if you fancy dipping a toe in the water, um, don't want to commit to the full amount, then you can have a go and um, see how you get on. And if you if you run out of steam, we'll refund that against the purchase of one of our services. So that's it in terms of the main session. I hope you found that useful. Um, I would suggest to anybody who's um, thinking, okay, yeah, I've got an issue, my main recommendation is please do something about it. Don't bang your head against the wall like that poor chap did who I showed you his email, um, who'd been you know, literally three years trying to get interest and just wasn't getting it. If you're not getting the interviews, it is your CV that's the problem. Virtually guarantee that. Do something about it. Whatever you do, do something. Um, this offer will help if you're inclined to go down that route. Um, but you've got to make your mind up fairly quickly, in, in truth. Um, there are some people who want to buy the pr uh, product. And if you're thinking, well, how quickly do I need to commit? You, you don't actually need to commit to doing the work until you're ready to go. So there's plenty of people who order these things and then say, can I take advantage of it in a week's time, two weeks' time, a month, two months? That's fine. As long as you let us know, we'll accommodate it. Um, so you can take advantage of the deal, lock that away, and then just tell us when you'd like to take advantage of it. That's perfectly acceptable. For those that need to go, um, we've got overrun a little bit, so I do apologize for that. But hopefully you've got something out this evening. You're more than welcome to disappear. If you do need to speak to us, by all means, drop us an email, visit our website. Um, more than willing to help on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, for those that have asked questions, um, I will um, come back to those right now. And if you want to hang on and listen to the answers, you're more than welcome. Um, I don't think when I just quickly look, there are not enough for me to uh, skip any. So I'll, literally, I'll answer everybody's question where one has been asked. Um, and uh, for those that were late joiners and didn't hear me right up front, you'll get a link to a recording of this session tomorrow morning, so you can review, should you wish to do so, um, what we've been talking about again. So I'm just going to shut down this um, presentation and then move on to the, the uh, questions. So just 
give me a couple of sec uh, seconds whilst I tweak a few.